Hello everyone and welcome back to our Aquarium Online Academy. Once again, my name is Dana. I'm a member of the Education Department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, coming to you live from Long Beach, California. Now today in this next half hour program, we are going to be chatting about jellies and plankton. Now you might have first looked at the title of that class and went, I don't get why they're talking about both of those things, but jellies actually are are plankton okay and in order to understand that the way we're going to talk about this class today is we're going to define plankton we're going to talk about what makes an animal plankton or what makes plankton plankton and then we're going to break that down into two distinct groups and that's going to be animals that spend their entire life as plankton and animals that start out as plankton and then grow into something known as um, either a benthic animal or nectin which is a swimming organism, which again, we'll kind of define later on. Um, and we're gonna explore some animals that fit that life cycle. And so um, what I hope you walk away with from this program today is the fact that an animal that we might think of as this really big charismatic creature can actually start out as plankton as well. So um, if you're watching this class during our live feed today, which, which is Tuesday, June 23rd at two o'clock in the afternoon, we do have a phone number that you can text. It's right over here. It's 562 uh, 286 1838. And I have Cynthia in the studio with me who's going to be taking your live questions or observations and fielding them in towards me. And then, of course, I do still have Sarah, who's going to be controlling what's going on the screen behind me. Now, throughout this program, um, if you have questions, observations, anything you want to text in, feel free to text us at that number. However, keep in mind that standard texting rates do apply. And if you're one of our younger viewers, do ensure that you have adult permission before joining us today. Now, if you're watching after our live stream, again, this is going on Tuesday, June 23rd at 2 in the afternoon. If it's not that time, go ahead and shoot your questions to this email address right over here. This is live at lbaop.org. And we'll make sure that we can get to that and answer any questions that you might have um, after the fact. So awesome. Now that you've joined us, hopefully you have those phones ready. You have your eyes ready. You got your brains ready. We're going to be chatting about plankton. Now, to do this, um, we're going to go over to my special camera on the side and we're going to highlight what some kind of plankton are. Okay. So, we're getting all set up over here. Got to turn it on, turn the light on. It's going to take a second to adjust. All right. Now, plankton. Let's see, where's my... Da, da, da. Okay. So, plankton actually has a very specific definition. Okay. I'm going to write it down here. Any organism that cannot swim against, my pen's kind of dying, against the current. Okay? So any organism that cannot swim against the current. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Any organism that cannot swim against the current. Now it's not any organism that can't swim, right? It's any organism that cannot swim against the current. So jellies, while they are moving around and bouncing around and kind of pulsing, they are not able to swim against a current. They can have vertical migrations. They can swim up and down. If it's perfectly still water, they can more or less kind of move in a direction. But if there's any current moving through, you can see here they're kind of just drifting, right? They're sort of just going with the flow. And so the textbook definition of plankton is a drifter. Someone that does not, or something that cannot swim against the current and they drift wherever that water may take them. So, um, like I said, jellies are one example of that. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about these in a moment. But first, let's break plankton down into its two groups. So, let's see if this blue pen is any better. Mm, kind of. All right. So now, plankton. I like to break plankton down into two groups, all right? One of them is over here, it's kind of like a little tree. One of them is over here. Now on this side, we're going to call it 
holoplankton. Okay? Holoplankton. Now, I remember this because it says whole, and it spends their whole life. Okay? Obviously, it's a different spelling, but whole life as plankton. As a drifter, right? Now the other side of this is maroplankton. Now maroplankton spends merely, or just a little, part of their life as plankton. So merely, I'm not sure if that's how you even spell merely, but that works. Merely part of their life. Now, what that means is at some point within this animal's um, life cycle, right, so life cycle is going from one stage to another of that organism, um, they are plankton, but then they can settle into different kinds of animals. So then they can settle into, let's say, a benthic organism, which is an animal that lives on the bottom, or they can become pelagic, which is an animal that swims within the water column. So, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. Nope, looks like I'm all right, already all the way out. But you get the idea that plankton is broken down into these two groups, okay? Now, knowing the definition of each of these groups, where do you think jellies falls? Are they meroplankton? Do they spend merely part of their life as plankton? Or are they holoplankton, spending their whole life as plankton, right? Now, jellies at one point are sessile, meaning that they are attached to the rock when they're little ones, but for the most part, their whole life cycle, they are spending as plankton, right? Once they're growing into adults. And so I like to think of them as over here. They spend pretty much their whole life as plankton. And so when we think of plankton originally, I'm guessing that a lot of you thought about teeny tiny little organisms, like what we're going to put right here. Okay, so these are examples of phytoplankton, plant-like plankton, okay? And then um, there's also zooplankton, which is animal plankton, all right? Now, it looks like Sarah's going to pull up my favorite video of plankton, and we're going to see what that looks like here. I'll step off so you really get the full effect. So phytoplankton is plants, and zooplankton, let's see, that's a little crab, we call them zoeas. Um, I think that's a sea star. Shows up somewhere around here, right there, maybe. Um, all sorts of animals. Ooh, that's a snail. You can sort of see that looks like a snail, right? So these are examples of um, zooplankton, and even more importantly, these will be meroplankton, but we'll talk about that later. So is a jelly holoplankton or meroplankton? And then are they phytoplankton or zooplankton? Is that a plant or an animal? Now, it might surprise you. Some people are very surprised that jellies are actually animals, right? But it might not look like an animal that you and I are used to. Do you see eyes? Not really. Do you see a nose or a mouth? Hmm. It's a little bit different, right? However, they are still an animal. They have animal cells, and they drift, and they spend their whole life drifting through the ocean. So that means they are zooplankton and they are holoplankton. So they fit those two categories, okay? Now let's see if we can check out some other different uh, jelly species that we, can, we have. And we'll sort of talk a little bit more about jellies and what it means to be a jelly. Now some of you might be asking, why are you saying jellies and not jellyfish, right? And that's a great question and a good observation. So here at the aquarium, we refer to them as jellies or sea jellies because this animal right here is not a fish. Now, in order to be a fish, they have to have a backbone or a central spinal cord, um, and jellies are something called invertebrates. They don't have that characteristic. So to keep from confusing people that it might be a fish, we have removed that from the name, and we refer to it as a sea jelly. Now, we did have a question, what do plankton eat? Great question. So let's answer that by talking about what jellies eat. And jellies, which are a type of plankton, feed on more plankton, right? So they're drifters and they drift through the ocean. And these uh, tentacles, these are uh, a very short image of tentacles. But if we were to go back to that other one, the nettle, um, you can see 
they're going to have really, really long, there we go, long tentacles that come all the way down. These long skinny ones are used to sting their prey. Now a jelly this big, this could probably eat a fish, right? So it's going to eat or sting whatever brushes across it. Then that's transferred to these other kind of more frilly tentacles. Those are their oral arms um, or oral tentacles. And that actually moves it up in towards the mouth. Now that's right, my friends. At first we couldn't identify a mouth on our jellies, right? But if we were to look right inside, this is where that mouth would be. And their mouth um, is kind of cool. So they take the food in, they digest it in their stomachs, and then it comes right back out of the same hole. Hmm. I'm going to let you kind of play that in on your uh, play that over in your head for a second. Let's go back to the moon jelly. See if we can identify the stomachs that I just mentioned. Aha. Do you see anything that might look like a stomach? Well, it does it doesn't look like my stomach, right? But that's because these four spots right there, look at that timing. <laughs> those four spots right there, those are actually the stomachs of our moon jellies here. And they are see-through. So we can actually see what's inside of their stomach. Now, moon jellies like this, this little stuff that's sticking to their tentacles right here, and then causing their, their stomachs to be a little bit more opaque, that's a smaller plankton called brine shrimp. Here at the aquarium, we feed our jellies, or our moon jellies, brine shrimp. Um, have you ever heard of sea monkeys? It's a very common toy that you can get in um, like the 90s. It's been around a lot longer than that, but I for sure remember it back then. Um, they are a modified version of a brine shrimp. And so these are itty bitty tiny little ones, okay? You'd have to have a microscope to really see them, but this is what our jellies eat. Now, if we jump back to that photo, so I want you to think about the fact that we can see into this animal's stomach, right? Check it out. If you could see into your stomach right now, what do you think it would look like? Hmm. Not great, right? Kind of dirty and gross and full of food. Hopefully full of food, right? And so um, humans have something called a, a true gut. Things work all the way through our system, right? But jellies, like I said, the food goes in their mouth. It goes into those stomachs and is digested. The nutrients are absorbed. And then it comes right back out the same hole. And that's called a blind gut. Ah, now somebody wants to know, are the stings from jellies very painful or not that bad? It actually depends on the species. So this species that you see on the screen behind me right here, these are moon jellies. They're found all up and down our coastline here. And they are not strong enough to sting us. Now when I say that, I want you to think about what I mentioned they eat microscopic itty bitty little plankton right and so they don't need to pack a very strong punch to be able to take down their prey item however that sea nettle that we mentioned right here they're going to be out drifting in the pelagic zone which is kind of the open ocean offshore and they're going to be really have uh they're not swimming right they're going wherever the current takes them so they have to be ready and able to take down prey which means these jellies pack a little bit stronger of a sting. Um, it also just, it, so it depends on their prey. It also depends on our hands, right? So our hands have about seven layers of skin on them. And so um, the moon jellies aren't strong enough to get through that. But what if you were to lick a moon jelly? I've never done it. But um, the skin on our lips or the skin on our tongue is a little bit different. I wonder if we would feel it then, right? I certainly wouldn't want to try, but I'm curious. Now, somebody wanted to know, so are jellies cannibals? Caitlin wants to know that. So to be a cannibal, you have to eat your own kind. And I don't actually know the answer to that. Would a jelly eat another jelly? They can, I've been told. Um, ah, so sea nettles eat moon jellies. So they might eat another kind of jelly. So yeah, depending on your definition of a cannibal, I guess you could kind of say that they were. Interesting. Um, now the next question is why do jellies sting? You all are bringing in really great questions, questions today. I love it. So why do jellies sting? Well, I kind of mentioned it already, right? I want you to think about what I said they use those stingers for. Right. They sting their prey. Now, if we look, remember, they don't have eyes, they don't have a nose, they don't have, well, they do have a mouth, but it doesn't look like ours. Do they have arms? Do they have hands to grab their prey with? Are they able to come over? Ooh, cake, 
right? I grab cake with two hands. <laughs> no, they're not. So instead, the stinging cells that line their tentacles, those sting into their prey, and they also kind of act like little hooks. So if you've ever touched a jelly or an anemone, which is a related um, organism, they feel there's an anemone. They feel sticky. Now that stickiness is those stingers going into our skin, but not going so deep that it hurts us, right? Remember I said we have multiple layers, um, but they stick into that animal and that's what brings them in towards the mouth. So it's a great adaptation that allows these animals to catch food without hands to grab it, right? Or even big strong jaws, like, like a shark doesn't have hands either, but they have nice big strong jaws to latch onto their prey, right? So um, really great question. Why do jelly sting? So with that in mind, let's take a look at some other jelly species, if we have any. I'm not sure what we've got. Ah, beautiful. We have a crystal jelly. Now this one looks a little bit different, and it's hard to see in this photo, but this is actually quite a tiny jelly, okay? And these animals, though, they do have the same thing. They have those long skinny tentacles, right? All jellies have this bell-like shape, okay? Now, the largest jelly in the world, I don't actually think we have a photo of it, but the largest jelly, this bell shape right here, it's called the lion's mane jelly, and it can get seven feet from tip to tip, from side to side, which is incredibly huge. And their tentacles can grow to be over 100 feet long. Now, remember, friends, when I mentioned jellies, in the, or I'm sorry, plankton in the beginning, where did your mind go? Were you picturing a hundred foot long jellyfish? No, we were thinking about our tiny little plankton buddies, right? And yet, like I said, jellies are plankton. So that seven foot wide, hundred foot long lion's mane jelly is plankton. Something you can see with the naked eye, which is really amazing. And that is gonna be our transition into meroplankton. So let's jump back to our document camera for a moment. Remember, we talked about these. They spend their whole life as plankton. And there are a lot of other examples. Um, for example, krill or those brine shrimp would be examples of holoplankton. They spend their life um, in that small, unable to swim against the current um, uh, life cycle, life stage. Now, meroplankton is a little bit different. Remember, they are spending only part of their life as plankton. I'm going to answer the last few jelly questions that we have here. So one of the questions was, how big do box jellies get? Yeah, that's a good question. So box jellies, the largest one can be 10 inches across and 10 feet long. Now, I know when we usually think about box jellies, we are all picturing something that's like the size of our thumb, right? But in reality, there's a couple different species of, of box jellies. And so it just depends on what kind you're talking about. Now, the next question was, which jelly's sting is the most painful? Ooh, I don't know, because I've never been stung by a big jelly. So I think box is usually the worst. Portuguese man of war is often known as one of the worst, um, and yet they're not a true jelly. They're a colonial animal where parts of that animal are actually other animals. It's very confusing. But um, yeah, I mean, they say the box jelly is definitely the most uh, intense venom, right? So um but I also imagine if I was a little brine shrimp, a moon jelly wouldn't feel good. So I think it's all comparative. <laughs> all right, so let's jump back um, into the studio here. And we're, again, we're going to be talking about meroplankton, okay? And so for our meroplankton subject, I want you to think for a moment. We're not going to put anything on the screen. I want you to think. Sarah pulled her hands off the keyboard. She's like, okay, I'm not touching it. Um, what is an example of an animal that spends part of its life as plankton? Hmm. Can you think of any ideas? Let's see. Ooh, I've got a couple. Okay. If you're thinking fish or crabs or lobsters or anemones or sea urchins or octopus or throw them at me. What else have we got? Sea stars, a squid, cuddles. All of these organisms that we just yelled, those are examples of meroplankton. So go ahead and put that, um, my favorite, on again. <laughs> so I'm going to show you that, that footage of those little planktons, kind of the zooming out as they drift. And I want to point out some examples of organisms that are meroplankton. So you remember I, might have, I said there was a crab, a little zoea in there. Um, there was also a little baby snail. There was a sea star. Now, 
during this, so let's see, so there's the baby crab. Um, that's called a, let's see, uh, I think that's the sea star. Um, let's see, that's the snail, right? You can actually see the shell kind of showing up. There's another snail behind me, right? All of these organisms, a lot of them are examples of the little babies that drift through the ocean and eventually settle to either become, um, become benthic animals, remember those are our bottom animals, or pelagic animals swimming in the water column. But at this stage of their life, can they swim against a current? <laughs> no, not at all, right? Um, I would be very impressed if that tiny little microscopic crab was able to swim against the current. Um, and so these animals, like I said, are examples of meroplankton. Let's go ahead and put the adult version of these animals on and kind of try to retrain our brain to remember that these, in fact, do fall under the category of plankton for at least a point in their life here. So pretty much everything on this screen, at one point, even that fish, we get a lot of questions about that fish, by the way, it's a painted greenling, was plankton, okay? Now, invertebrates like this often do something called broadcast spawning. In order to have babies, mom releases cells into the water, dad releases cells into the water, um, so male or female, and then when those cells come together, they form the baby. However, that then just drifts. It just goes, it rides the current until it's heavy enough to settle and become its own adult version of the organism. And so, um, our anemones started out as little plankton. Our sea stars started out as little plankton. That fish that swam by started out as little plankton. Um, there it is. Anything else in here? Even this algae probably would have started out as little plankton, right? A lot of phytoplankton then settles and grows. Um, so I want and you to retrain your brain to the fact that all of these animals that we think of as being like a larger animal, um, they do start out as itty bitty little babies. Now we had a question from Michael. Michael wants to know what eats jellies. Great question, because um, even the one of the animals that eats jellies, it is the largest bony fish in the world. Whoa, right? Now there's a couple words in there I wanna highlight. I said bony fish. That means it's an animal with bones. It's a vertebrate, so it has a main spinal cord and a, cord and a backbone, um, and it's not a shark or a ray. Those are cartilaginous fish. Their skeletal systems are made of cartilage. But a bony fish actually feeds on jellies. And it's the largest one in the world. It's this animal right here. It's called the mola mola. But guess what? Even though it holds the title of being the largest bony fish in the world, it can be like 14 feet from tip to tip right there from the, from the um, fins. Guess what this animal starts out as? Sarah's going like this. That's right, my friend plankton. So this is another example of meroplankton. It's spending part of its life cycle as plankton. Now another kind of record holding um, characteristic of this animal is the fact that they can have over 300 million eggs at a time. 300 million. That's so incredible. It's one of the most um, highest number of reproducing eggs out there. And so um, all of those start out as little plankton and then they grow and grow and grow. Now this is an example of an organism that is pelagic. So unlike our crabs and our lobsters that we were talking about and our anemones are being our benthic animals, this one spends its time out in the open water column. Now we have one organism here that's actually really exciting. We'd love to highlight. It starts out as plankton as well and then it becomes this very charismatic animal that calls the kelp forest its home. And the Aquarium of the Pacific was fortunate enough to be able to raise this animal from itty bitty little plankton up to um, this form and then more. Now this right here, does anybody know? Have you ever seen this animal before? It comes up on our screen a lot actually because we're all pretty big fans. But this animal right here is a baby giant sea bass. Okay, and again, we're retraining our brains. We're opening some new doors. This animal, when it was born, started out as plankton. In fact, when our aquarists here, um, we're learning a little bit more about the, the life cycle and learning how to raise them and grow them in, a, in under human care. They were working with tiny little microscopic organisms and they had a bunch of them. And then they had to make sure that those organisms were getting fed. And one of the ways we did that was realizing that like there's, there was food in the water and now there's not. 
that's a good sign that they got that food, right? <laughs> and then we raised them and raised them, and this organ, this tiny little microscopic organism, grew into a fish that was still pretty small, couldn't really swim against the current. And then it grows, and that's probably about this big. I know it looks really big, but it was it was like the size of a quarter. Then they grow a little bit more. Right now, the Aquarium of the Pacific has about five or six of them, I believe, in one of our our exhibits, the so uh, the Long Beach Breakwater exhibit in our Southern California gallery is home to about five of them, I believe. Um, and they're maybe that big, okay? And then we'll throw up a, a, either a photo or a video, whatever we have access to, um, here we go, of the adult form. Now, once again, friends, this is a large fish. It's not the mola mola, it's not the largest. But this fish can grow to be about five to six feet long, over 500 pounds, average, they're only around three or 400. Um, but it can for sure swim against the current, right? When you look at this animal, you're like, yeah, that's a strong swimmer. It lives in the ocean, doing good. Definitely not or never was plankton. And yet, like I said, they start out as such itty bitty little babies. So again, opening some doors in our brain, remembering that these animals do have different life cycles and remembering that the definition of plankton is an organism that cannot swim against the current. Now, I want you to um, think for a moment Okay, I want you at home to come up with some ideas of other examples of plankton. All right, what do you think? Can you think of any? It looks like we have a couple more questions coming in as well. So we're going to wrap this up by taking your questions or taking your observations or taking your ideas, right, of examples of plankton. But what I hope that you really gathered is the fact that plankton is a textbook definition that's then broken down into very different organisms, right? It's not just those microscopic little animals that we think of. It can cover a whole immense world of our oceans. And so Cynthia's writing some questions down right now. But again, I hope you're thinking of some other examples. Go ahead and turn to your dog, turn to your cat, turn to your pets, turn to your parents, turn to your friends, turn to your family. Share those ideas. That's my favorite plankton. That is a little baby octopus right there. Ah, great question. Holy moly. I don't think I have an answer to this question. So the question is, how big does an organism need to be to go against the current? I'm going to say it depends on the organism and it depends on the muscles. So um, for some of them, it depends. Uh, it's not necessarily about swimming against the current, but about becoming a benthic animal, right? Meaning they live on the bottom. And so that just means that like when a crab becomes heavy enough to settle, okay? Um, and so that depends on size and weight. But as far as swimming against the current, I'm going to say depends on the, the muscles. So some fish um, might be this big swimming against the current. Some fish might be this big, this big, this big, right? It really just depends on the animal. I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, but I love the thought process there, right? Now, I have a really challenging question. If you were to jump into a raging river, whoosh, are you plankton? What do you think? You can't swim against the current. Now, I think that definition refers to like a normal current, not a raging river, right? <laughs> uh, but it still kind of shows the gray area of understanding what it means to be certain kind of animals or certain skills. Um, so the same can be said for like the size. It depends on what current, right? So thank you all for joining us today at our online academy. We are going to be wrapping it up in the studio here, but you uh, provided us with some really great thoughtful questions today, starting at um, what organ what animal is more intelligent we had that question earlier and uh, we got into the discussion about whether or not um, it depends how you define intelligence right that last question you sent in again it depends on how you define swimming against the current or what the base of current is uh, so you've really made us think today and we always enjoy days that kind of keep us on our toes so we will be back tomorrow morning at nine o'clock we're going to be doing let's check wetland habitats. So if you want to come back tomorrow morning at nine, we'll be learning a little bit more about habitats that are common around here in Southern California um, and yet diminishing. So join us then. Otherwise, have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon and we'll see you later. Bye everyone. Thanks so much.